Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about zinc and magnesium and ADHD and whether they can really help or not. And it's not looking like the clock is working right now, so I'm not sure if I'm recording, but I'll keep going anyway. So I'll be talking 15, 20 minutes. If you have questions while I'm talking, you can certainly type them in, and I will try to answer them at the end of the discussion. These will be posted on Facebook and YouTube so you can ask questions at a later time as well. So trace minerals and magnesium actually is present in bigger amounts and trace amounts are similar to vitamins and that our body needs small amounts of these substances. We can't generate them ourselves and they are absolutely essential for life. Um, chemically, the minerals are minerals, though they're not vitamins. Um, and we know that tiny amounts of metals, minerals, metals, um, can have profound impacts on behavioral health, as witnessed by what lead poisoning or mercury poisoning do in both of those toxins. Their primary, primary symptoms are neurologic and psychiatric and can be lethal in just tiny, tiny amounts. With both of those exposures, um, Consumption is more through probably inhaled fumes and with lead as well, paint chips and ingestion of things that aren't normal food items. But most of um, zinc and magnesium we're getting through our diets. And some of the interest in this is based on the claims, and there's a fair amount of evidence that there is de deficiencies in some people, maybe fairly widespread in certain cultures of these metal minerals metals and that those deficiencies may lead to certain conditions like ADHD or may contribute I mean primarily it's more interacting with genetically susceptible individuals and maybe the genetic susceptibilities of inherent in ADHD make someone also process these metals slightly differently as part of the possibility um, so one thing is with modern agricultural approaches where we have been depleting lots of vital nutrients from the soil that has a corresponding impact on how nutritious the food we're eating and separate from what we've done to the soil itself, how we've genetically bred many grains, more fruits and vegetables to look beautiful rather than to be nutritious. We may have consequently been taking actions that are resulting in a less nutritious food source. Um, and one of the ways that ADHD also compounds with this issue is that we know measurably, and this is not everybody, but certainly youth in America who have ADHD eat a more junk food prone diet. They eat a less nutritious diet to begin with. Um, so that may well be compounding potential vitamin but again, mineral, metal deficiencies. Um, so there's, when I approached this, I was sort of skeptical seeing it, even though I have a strong pro-natural environment bias and I'm a bird watcher, a nature boy myself, but I felt that much of the research was generated by people who cast medications as evil and were looking for alternatives and trying to find evidence where maybe there wasn't as much evidence. Um, so there have been several dozen studies in this area. What I should say is all the studies are fairly small. Um, the studies are done in a variety of different locations and there is certainly a sort of anti-US bias or I'd say a, or a marked US absence in the literature, not completely in total. But for most of biological medicine and psychiatric research, the preponderance of it has been done in America and in other Western industrial countries. Um, that's much less so with this zinc, magnesium, ADHD connection. Um, so again, it's harder to know how much of this will generalize to US populations. It's also, and this is gonna sound um, U.S. biased, but it is. It's harder to judge the quality of the research coming from some of these other research 
places when they are not mainstream um, centers for research or exploration. That doesn't mean they're doing bad work. It just means it's harder to assess a priori whether it's good work. And there's also difficulties in looking at in studying these medicines in terms of what should we even be looking at. So for example, with both magnesium and zinc and other metals, um, it's fairly easy to assess serum, the, the fluid that blood cells are floating in. Um, but serum levels of zinc or magnesium may not correlate well with what's actually in blood cells themselves. And that may not correlate very well. And in several studies, it clearly doesn't with what's in the body itself or body stores, which are often assessed by hair samples or other assessments. So if you're looking only at serum levels and you don't notice a difference, does that reflect that there isn't really a difference in magnesium levels between two populations? No, it doesn't. There may be you know, substantial differences in other reservoirs in the body or other ways of looking at it. Um, and another area of, of why it's hard to judge some of these studies, some of these informal reports, which I wouldn't even say are studies, are generated by um, supplement and nutraceutical companies that have a product to push. And that doesn't mean that their data isn't accurate, but they may be less prone to report negative findings if that's what their study showed. And some of these studies are involving products that have an array of dozens of different metals, vitamins, supplements, other, um, other content. And it's hard to know was the zinc or the magnesium the important one, or was that irrelevant to the whole mix? Um, so given all those aside, the more I look, the more it does seem that there is at least a kernel of something important and valid in this research and studies. And I've delved into dozens of papers, and I'm trying to give a sort of a synthesis and overview. And I certainly do need to spend more time myself on researching this more. but. Here's what I found about magnesium. So there, we know, and there are several studies showing that in the general population, many people are magnesium deficient. The ranges in the studies though range from as low as 2% to as much as 50% in the general population. Again, that's an incredibly diverse number, and that's hard to know, are these just different geographic populations? Are we studying it differently? What does this mean? A number of other studies, though, have suggested that the consumption of foods containing magnesium is, is below what would be expected to be sufficient for, again, a, and often about a quarter of the population um, is not taking in enough magnesium-laden foods. Um, so magnesium-laden foods include the nuts, the grains, our leafy greens, and for particular interest in lots of people with ADHD, tea, coffee, and cocoa are all good sources of magnesium. So great. Um, bananas, avocados are also good sources. So a number of studies, though, have shown rates as high as high 70s to 90% of kids with ADHD do seem to be magnesium deficient. So these are numbers higher than the controlled comparison groups in all these studies. So there seems to be some at least real correlation. Um, and again, um, so it's another way though to lower magnesium levels rather than just not eating enough for food sources is that we know that diets that are particularly high or low in protein can affect absorption. So either extreme there and people taking protein proton pump inhibitors to, to lower stomach acidity um, can also lower your magnesium absorption. So a few studies, not particularly ADHD focused, have suggested that those with magnesium deficiency are more likely to have problems with anxiety, depression, irritability, poor concentration, and in areas outside of the ADD field, there's a growing, again, it's not huge or vast body of literature suggesting magnesium, particularly if you are deficient, can have calming properties. There's debate as to whether it can 
help with sleep or whether it's more helping with arousal, irritability, anxiety, and that indirectly helps with sleep. But there are a handful of studies that have specifically looked at kids with ADHD and low magnesium, gave them supplements of magnesium for usually in the two to six month range, and found measurable improvements in ADD symptoms, including not just hyperactivity and impulsivity and sort of things that might correlate with the irritability anxiety realm, but even inattentiveness was improved in a small number of studies. Now, some of these studies also used vitamin B6, pyridoxine, um, along with the magnesium to get the magnesium absorbed better. And that makes it harder to sort out, are these benefits a result of just the magnesium or are they magnesium and B6? At least one used only magnesium and had positive results. Um, so my taking from this is that probably supplementation in the range of one to two, one to 300 milligrams a day of zinc and either glycinate or chelated, did I say the zinc? I should have just said magnesium. Magnesium, glycinate, magnesium, chelate in the 100 to 300 milligram range is probably safe, is probably beneficial if you have a magnesium deficiency and may well help with some ADHD symptoms. A word or two, the commonest side effects in any of these studies have been gastrointestinal, um, whether it's direct magnesium having gastrointestinal impact or that magnesium is just not that well absorbed and the poor absorption may cause that. And a different form of magnesium in terms of magnesium hydroxide is the basic ingredient of milk of magnesium, which is used as a laxative because it isn't well absorbed. It's passing through the body and pulling other things with it um, quickly. Um, but again, in this dosage range, 100 to 300 milligrams, GI side effects should be minimal and again, potential benefit. So switching over a little bit to zinc. So zinc is a trace mineral. So there are only a total a few milligrams throughout your whole body, but zinc is incredibly important. More than 300 different enzymes. It's our protein beast proteins that catalyze chemical reactions in the body. Um, absolutely require zinc for their functioning. Um, zinc is found throughout the body, but highest concentrations in the prostate and eye. And we know that the estimates are something like 2 billion, almost a third of the world population is somewhat zinc deficient. And low zinc results in problems with diarrhea, absorption of other foods, and propensity towards infections. Um, there are problems, more risk with zinc supplementation in terms of taking too much and that having zinc levels that are too high can actually suppress your copper levels and your iron levels, both of which are again a vital in at least some amount for a range of body functions, um, iron particularly related to hemoglobin and anemia if you don't have enough of it but in the range of 20 to 25 milligrams. So a few st study surveys have linked higher proportion of kids with ADHD do seem to be zinc deficient compared to kids their same age in the same area. Um, again, how, how prevalent that is is not completely clear. And there are a few studies using supplementation with fairly low dosages, 20 to 25 milligrams a day um, which have yielded results where children who were on stimulants were able to substantially, in substantials, 35 to 40% decrease in stimulant dose just with zinc supplementation. Um, there have been other studies suggesting that maybe with milder levels of ADHD, the zinc may directly address ADHD symptoms in lower hyperactivity may lower inattentiveness. Again, we need more studies on this. Um, at low dosage ranges, there's very low likelihood of toxicity from either zinc or magnesium. And a small but growing body of evidence that suggests 
many of us are deficient, particularly ADHD kids may be deficient. Not a lot has been studied in adults to know what, how common deficiencies in either of these are in adults. Um, so that's the summary of what I have to say with ADD and zinc and magnesium. I do see there's a question, so I'll be getting reading that in a second. Um, then next week's talk is uh, Friday at 11 is going to be on dementia and ADHD. So somehow I'm trouble reading the full question. It's not there. So the question is, can you please message recommended amounts of magnesium zinc? And you said to take B6 with the magnesium, correct? So I'll repeat it and I'll write it down later. So B6 does seem to help with absorption of magnesium and may decrease some of the digestive issues. The recommendation for magnesium is so far in the range of 100 to 300 milligrams, and particularly the um, chelate or the um, and the other, the glycinate forms that, and zinc has been studied most and found helpful in the range of just 20 to 25 milligrams a day. So another question. Um, I notice myself having no interest or energy prepping for meals, which of course leads to unhealthy diets. I'm trying to have at least one of the fresh fruit or veggie dishes every day. Not even sure how about how I'm doing nutrition wise. Any suggestions? I mean, one suggestion, I mean, this is a common, it, it's sort of tied into the ADD observation that things that are interesting are easier to do and things that are important, even though you understand the importance, are harder to do if they're not interesting. Um, so one is if there's a way to make cooking more interesting for you, either experimenting with different cuisines or trying to um, you know, research different types of recipes ahead of time. I, I know, again, that requires another step of planning and investment. So one of my alternative approaches, and this I'm aware does require financial resources, is that rather than just sort of relying on your own self to do the cooking and particularly the shopping, which is the, the bigger barrier, because if you haven't shopped ahead, that in many, particularly urban areas, there's a whole variety of sort of pre-made, either the whole meal is made and cooked for yourself or they're giving you a whole assembled ingredients ready to go with minimal prep work. And many of these are tasty, well-balanced and provide the variety that your own cooking may not do. So subscribing to one of those may be a big time saver, maybe Yes, it's an investment, but if you're eating better, feeling better, maybe a good option for you. And many of them, you can start with a, you know, just a few week or once a week commitment rather than a bigger investment until you see whether it works for you. So the question is whether these amounts are safe for kids. So, so the answer is yes. Um, most of these studies, again, were done in kids. It may be that adults may require slightly larger amounts. Um, again, with many substances, the, the, even the, the body size isn't the biggest determining factor because kids have higher me metabolic rates. So even though an adult may be seven or eight times bigger than a young child, um, they may not necessarily need seven or eight times as much because their metabolism almost certainly is is again slower than the kids and both the zinc and the magnesium most of our heavy metals are urinarily excreted um, so it's relatively hard except in you know massive overdoses to build up huge overdose amounts um, so that's sounds like it for today I hope I've answered all the questions I will be writing those answers out in a few minutes and Again, next week's topic is going to be dementia and ADHD. What, if any, is the connection? So have a good, safe, and sane week, and I'll be back next week.